Welcome to Between the Covers, the show for readers and writers and lovers of books. I'm Stephanie and I'm a publisher at Red Penguin Books, where we publish books of all types and genres. So if you have a book in your head, maybe one all ready to go, or maybe even 300 sheets of loose leaf shoved into a drawer. And yes, probably about once a month, I get an envelope filled with loose leaf and napkins. Visit us at redpenguinbooks.com and unleash your inner author. I'm so thrilled today to be joined by two authors who have totally unleashed themselves. Um, Glenn Dahlgren is the author of Child, The Child of Chaos. And in The Child of Chaos, he writes, an irresistible longing drags young Galen to an ancient vault where long ago, the gods of order locked chaos away. Chaos promises power to the one destined to liberate it, but Galen's dreams warn of dark consequences. He isn't the only one racing to the vault, however. Horace, the bully who lives to torment Galen, is determined to unleash chaos, and he might know how to do it. Galen's imagination always got him into trouble, but now it may be the only thing that can prevent Horace from unraveling the world. Please welcome our first author, Glenn Dahlgren. Glenn, so nice to have you. Hi, thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And yeah, chaos. We think that it's a good idea to lock chaos away, don't we, in our own personal lives? Uh, yeah, we try it, but a lot of us understand that uh, chaos is about creativity and unpredictability, and it's kind of the way things change. And if you assume that chaos is just bad and you lock it away and you make a society that doesn't have any of it, bad things also happen. Mm. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you have personal experience with locking up chaos and living to tell about it. Uh, just, just contemplating the, uh, the concept, really. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate um, what chaos can bring to the picture. Absolutely. No, you're absolutely right about that. But tell me, what did inspire this book? What got you to write it? So it actually has a very interesting origin story. Um, so I'm a computer game designer. I've actually uh, designed games like you know, Death Gate, uh, based on the Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman novel. Um, oh, that's a real uh, job. You design video games. Yeah, I also I designed. Death Gate. Um, I loved it. I've I designed a Wheel of Time based on the Robert Jordan series of books, um, the Wheel of Time books. Um, so collaborating with. Um, with you know, established authors was a big part of my job for a long time. And I learned a lot in that process. Um, I, so I really enjoyed creating fiction in other people's worlds. Um, when, I, when we were looking to sell um, or try to get financing for Wheel of Time through a, 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 a publisher, um, we pitched it to a lot of different places. And one of them was Activision. Um, Activision was interested in it, but they actually didn't want the license. They didn't want Wheel of Time. They just liked the game. So then, and they told me this the night before I had to pitch it. And so the night before I had to come up with a premise for this game and uh, I did it and I was really proud of it. We pitched it, Activision ended up, we didn't go with Activision because they actually wanted the sort of doom quake technology and we were with Unreal and that was more GT. And GT actually ended up being our publisher. And after I completed the game and we shipped it and everything, I came back to that premise and I thought, that's really interesting. There's really some, some stuff there that I want to explore. Should I, this be my next game? And I realized it wasn't a game. It was a story. It was a novel. And that was 20 years ago. So 20 years ago, 20 years, I had been working on this book on and off while doing, you know, game design full time. And so uh, 20 years later, you know, the <laughs> Child of Chaos wow. came out. But the Thank you. The, um, the, the premise was strong enough, the world was strong enough, that I'm, I've created now a series in this, uh, in this world. The, pre, uh, the prequel to this book will be out in August, August 29th, um, and it's called The Game of War. Uh, so, and, I, and, and then The Curse of Chaos, which is book two, will be out uh, sometime next year. I, I'm not a fast writer, but I will eventually get to it. Very so cool. that's what inspired it. I mean, specifically about, you know, why, why are the characters the way they are and, and all of that. It's, you know, it has a lot to do with my own uh, feelings about fantasy, feelings about order and about subjugation and things like that. I, I have literally interviewed hundreds and hundreds of authors, and you are the first one whose book came out of 
video game design. <laughs> <laughs> I it's happened before. I'm not the first person to do it, but well, well, you're the first person on between the covers. That's for sure. Ah. Uh, CT, are you a gamer? Are you uh, like right there? With oh you? yes, I'm. I'm just absolutely uh, dedicated to gaming and uh certainly video games have influenced my writing those i don't design them unlike glenn here uh <laughs> and actually it's kind of funny there because i am a, both a wheel of time and get gate fan so uh other uh, impressions there and now i want to check out your book so congratulations <laughs> for you, sale. But, uh, you if know, you're that's the thing i said i was I'm on, on the show to get you to sell some books you sold one. So well. If you if you are a fan of the of the games, you might want to go to mysterium.blog, and there um, I actually have write ups of behind the scenes stories of how those games were made, oh. and they actually got a lot of attention, especially recently, um, because Wheel of Time is turning into a TV series um, uh, from Amazon, mm -hmm. and now I, so I went on the, the Dusty Wheel show, talked about the game, talked about the book, um, but a lot of big things are happening about Wheel of Time. And it got a lot of attention, especially on the 20th anniversary of the game, that write-up, because it's huge, and it has a lot of stuff you never would know unless you read it. And you tug your braid in the uh, video game. <laughs> no. She does have a braid, though. The, the main character does have a braid. You don't you get should, to tug You could sell that as an emote. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I realize that I firmly admit my my knowledge of playing video games is like Ms. Pac-Man. I'm dating myself here oh. terribly. Uh, although I have played like Super Mario Brothers too, but you know, hey. Um, but but these games actually have like novel like stories. Yeah, well, especially so. I worked for a company called Legend Entertainment, and Legend Entertainment started out as an offshoot of Infocom, and they made all the old text adventures like Zork and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, things like that. And so we, try, as an identity for our company, tried to um, create games based on established literary worlds. And so that's why we went after Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. We also did Xanth based on Piers Anthony's work. Um, we oh. did uh, um, a gateway based on Frederick Pohl's work. Um, there, there were a, a, quite a number of them. And that's, and that's sort of how we established our own identity. And they were adventure games. And adventure games aren't like Pac-Man or Mario mm -hmm. Brothers. They are based on story because you are an interactive um, participant in this story. You have to figure out the puzzles. You have to figure out who do I need to talk to and how do I need to convince him to do what I want him to do and get the thing he needs or you know, manipulate another character to, to interact with him. And so it's a story that's based on those books. You know, The Wheel of Time was a prequel. Um, actually, Jordan didn't want me retelling his story, but the, um, the Death Gate is actually a retelling of all I think seven, were there, I don't remember how many books there were, but at the time, I think there were seven books. And I managed to get most of those worlds into this game. Uh, so it, it is all about storytelling. And it's a, it was a great way for me to cut my teeth in making, in, in writing. Awesome. Now, tell me Maybe if you get Steph Stephanie a copy of King's Quest. Ooh. So we sort of move her up, uh, you know, maybe to the right. 90s and I, gradually will... eventually reach Witcher 3. <laughs> I mean, I do have two sons, so we have gaming consoles right here that I oh, yes. you know, plug into. Are these PC games or or PlayStation? Well, they were they were um, when I was designing um, mostly PC. I've done console design. Um, I actually did a an MMO RPG, Star Trek Online. Oh, um, oh I so, played that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving so, <laughs> um, so I've worked, I, 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 most recently I've done, I, I moved into Facebook games and, uh, and mobile games. Um, I did Glee, the game, the mobile game based on Glee, called Glee Forever. <laughs> Sorry. I, well, you know, I I felt the same way. I felt the same way when I was assigned the uh, the project. I had no idea. I'd never seen it. And then once I started seeing it, I mean, I I say I actually teach a class on game design, and I I always tell my students if you get a project, you have to find something about it to love. Otherwise, don't design that project because you know, especially if it's a license, because fans of that license will smell a bad version of the game from a mile off. And so I watched this show and there were two things I loved about it. The first was the writing. The writing actually was really good and really interesting. And the second was the music. Mm. And once you get those two things, I was able to pay off on an experience and that actually had story in it. Um, because I'm, I'm a story guy. I need to get story into every project that I do. 
Awesome. So, so yeah, I've, I've done a lot of those, a lot of those kind of games. Very cool. Now tell me about writing the novel as mm -hmm. opposed to writing the game story. You know, it, you said it took you how many years to write this novel? So <laughs> it took about 20 years to write that I novel. Mean, that's, that's a long time on one novel. I'm thinking there was a lot of drafts and I'm thinking that novel number two is not going to take nearly as long. Well, it yeah. novel number two took me about nine months. So you're right. Um, but it was also COVID, and then I had also learned a lot in the process of writing the first novel. Yes, well, but yeah, COVID 20 years is almost a J.R.R. Martin chapter. Exactly, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then, you know, COVID went both ways with people. I know a lot of books that got written during COVID. Mm -hmm. But I also know a lot of authors who were kind of frozen in place by COVID, that oh, they yeah. just couldn't, couldn't get it out. Um, but I'm, I'm delighted to hear that nine months after 20 years. So we're definitely picking up speed. <laughs> yeah, I, I think just figuring out my processes, yeah. and I'm still figuring out my process because I had a, an incredible beta reader at the end of the of Child of Chaos that changed everything for me, really gave me a perspective that I didn't have that I really needed. And I didn't have her on my second book. So I had to figure out how to, how to get something like that. And I ended up with a really good developmental YA fantasy editor that helped me out along those lines. So I'm still sort of trying to figure it out, um, but but I feel like I've got my my hands around it now, and I'm I'm going to keep moving forward. Hopefully, reduce that time even more. All right. Well, tell us a little bit about a Child of Chaos uh, besides the blurb I read. Give us the uh, the the inner what what's the struggle and what inspired you? What's personal about this? You know, it's um, so it's a world that is defined by these gods of order and the, the world is filled with these temples and each temple has a god um, that is defined by a specific aspect of humanity. So there's the temple of charity, there's the temple of good, there's the temple of evil, there's the temple of war. Uh, and there's you know, probably hundreds of these things I define maybe about, you know, 10 or 15. Um, and if you are born and you have a longing for one of these temples, then you will be pulled to um, this artifact inside the temple called uh, the gift, the, the temple's gift. And it's actually has, it contains a piece of the essence of the God of that temp, of that the religion. And so if you full, if you truly have this longing, you'll go there, you'll be tested, and those who uh, succeed become priests or priestess of that religion, of that temple. Um, but there are some people who are drawn to chaos because chaos is also out there. They just don't, nobody wants to admit it. And they, and those people are pulled to this place they call the vault. And, but unfortunately, evil has been given the task of taking care of anyone who shows up at that vault. So there's a lot of bones <laughs> around the place where evil, um, chaos is, is locked away. And our, and both our protagonist and our antagonist are both drawn to it. And they both are interested in what happens if that thing is, is freed, one more than the other. Actually, it's the antagonist who really wants to, to free it. Um, and, and the thing about it is the antagonist, um, he is so driven by chaos that order doesn't know how to deal with him. And he completely re changes the landscape of, of the, all these temples. And I won't, I won't give away you know, to a lot of the story. <laughs> but um, but the idea that this society is really um, is stagnant, um, really established, and yet if you pull a couple of, of strings, the whole thing could unravel. Right, right. Now, did you say the next book is the next book or the first book? Like yeah, so the, the next book, so one of the characters in there was a priest of war. Uh, his name is Dantes, and people love him. He's kind of an action hero. And I kind of, and he demanded um, a book. <laughs> he told me I, I have to have my own book. And so, and I decided I might write like a little novella for him, just use it as a reader magnet or something. And so I started writing it, and it became something much much larger and larger. And it became my uh, my prequel. And so it's a full science book. And my early reviews are people actually like it better than the than really? book one. Um, and a lot of the thinking that I did for book two is established now in book zero. So book two actually is kind of a sequel to book zero as much as it's a sequel to book one. 
Okay. So, so yeah, I, I think it's, it's mandatory reading for anyone, any fans of the series. You're going to want to read Game of War. Awesome. And where, what comes next? Uh, well, after that, I mean, I'm going to stay in this world. People love the world um, and they love the characters. So I'm going to stay in this world. And uh, the book two is going to be Curse of Chaos. At least that's the tentative title right now. Right. And that'll be out next year. Okay. And, and any thoughts about how many, how long are you, you're just in there now and that's where you're staying? Um, I mean, I have a couple of books sort of, you know, rolling around my head after that. Um, I actually have a couple of ideas for books outside of the series, but right now I'm just laser focused on that series. I want to get that done and out and, uh, and see what people think. And so far people have really loved it. So I'm, I'm thinking that why, why mess with a formula that exactly. seems to be working? If it ain't broke, don't fix yeah. it. I am all about that. Well, uh, for, for people who have series, our next book is from quite the series. Um, C.T. Phipps is the author of The Tournament of Super Villainy. Yes. And in The Tournament of Super Villainy, Gary Karkovsky, a.k.a. Merciless the Supervillain Without Mercy, is presently the most disliked supervillain in the world. Superheroes don't want to just throw him in jail. They want to deliver an epic beatdown for ending their golden age by killing Merciful, the superhero with mercy. His fellow supervillains aren't much better either, jealous of his success or loathing him for all the other baddies he's killed. Also, what's up with his wife, Mandy? She's been acting extra strange since getting her soul back. Well, that's a long story. And that's where <laughs> Gary receives an invitation to the primal fighting tournament, an interdimensional contest involving all the universe's greatest warriors. The prize, a wish with no limitations. So Gary can finally get on that world domination thing he's been putting off. Unfortunately, Gary is competing against good and evil way above his league. Not only Gabriel Anders, AKA ultra goddess, his former fiance, but in Tropicus, the space god of evil. Thankfully, Gary has allies from unexpected sources, including Jane Doe, the protagonist of I Was a Teenage Weirder, G from Agent G, and Cassius Mass from Lucifer Star. Please welcome author C.T. Phipps. Nice to have you here. Hey, thank you. This is the big crossover book between all my other books. Oh my gosh, yes. It's like all the heroes uh, and heroines from everybody else they yes. all together in this one. That was some oh, backstory. Yes. <laughs> yes, I mean, right. it's an interesting place you chose to do. That's book five. So uh, that was a kind of an interesting place to jump on there. That's where I'm uh, jumping on. I'm jumping on to book five. So fill in oh, yes. the blanks for us, could you? Yes. The rule of... Uh, the rule of the Rules of Super Villainy was my first book in the Super Villainy Saga, my first book, period. I wrote that as kind of a way to get all of my crazy, absurdist ideas about writing and uh, a thousand uh, wannabe Pratchett jokes out of my head regarding uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the DC uh, uh, Cinematic Universe, whatever it is, <laughs> and all the other 20, 30 years of comics I've been reading. <laughs> until then uh before i got to my quote unquote real writing mm -hmm. uh because when i decided to uh start out as an author i figured i would do one big fantasy series that would be my dresden files or focus and of all the time i was doing that i was like well i had this idea for a kind of a pseudo spider-man uh parody in the fact except he's a wizard and the idea was with great power comes great irresponsibility mm -hmm. so i just typed that one out there and uh, got it out very quickly. And I thought, okay, this is funny. And well, it's outsold all my other books combined. <laughs> oh, and, and by a pretty significant margin there too. Uh, the books mentioned on the back cover are my other uh, short trilogies of uh, pretty humorous books themselves there. Uh, Jane Doe is from I Was a Teenage Were-Deer, which is uh, a, a parody of the kind of... Uh, uh, I, I hate to say urban fantasy, paranormal romance kind of things there, but she's just a snarky young adult wannabe Veronica Mars with who turns furry uh, three nights a month and she lives in a town full of shifters. And I just thought, well, since I'm doing now for my fifth book of a superhero parody, my Crisis on Infinite Earths endgame thing, 
well, I don't have any other heroes except the ones I, I normally throw in the superhero book. So why don't I just throw in the characters of my other books and just the complete nonsensical plot line. In this case, I think I, uh, I deliberately make like 10 different Mortal Kombat jokes on the first page once I announce what the premise is. <laughs> And just like, oh, here's all these characters from worlds that are absolutely not superhero ones trying to deal with, uh, oh, we're in an entirely new genre now. And it, it worked pretty well, I thought, and people really loved it. And uh, I especially like throwing a G in there, three from my Agent G books, which are my fairly uh, darker than uh, my Super Villainy Saga book, uh, cyberpunk story about an assassin. It was like, okay, he's the perfect straight man for this because he comes from a world which does not have interdimensional travel, superheroes, or uh, snarky uh, teen superhero detectives. Mm -hmm. I was like, how does he react to all this? Not well. I and, that book, and that book really did well as because we were all getting a little tired of the Marvel crossover parodies back then. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and plenty of people do remember those comic books were going like, oh no, we have to cross over dimensions to save the entire multiverse from whatever is happening. And, you know, I had a lot of fun parodying those two. I think uh, on the CW network, they were also doing the crisis of that time there. And since that time, I now have had two books similar. So this is the fifth book and there are seven out. And, and the ca crossover characters keep coming back, even though that makes no sense with their series. <sighs> because <laughs> it's a parody book. I can do anything I want in it. <laughs> I love the glee with which you speak about your writing. I think that that is just oh. infectious. <laughs> well, it's a funny thing there where my best friend uh, commented on the fact is like, what do you think you are, Charles, a comedian? And I was like, I paused and said, well, I write books that uh, get people pay me to make them laugh. So I guess so. So I guess so. And you obviously love, love, love what you're doing. So how'd you get your start writing? Is it because you grew up with comic books and you just wanted, you wanted more? I think everyone has at least one book in them, good or bad. Mm -hmm. uh, but I always thought uh, I love storytelling, you know, whether it was tabletop gaming, playing uh, video games, where, which was the interactive fiction and thinking, well, I could probably give a try. And since I have a degree in literature, I at least uh, can pretend I know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And I don't. <laughs> but uh, going on with that, I decided to write uh, my first book, which was uh, which was a, called Cthulhu Armageddon and became like, which was a pastiche of H.P. Lovecraft's a world, except doing the post-apocalypse uh, Mad Max thing with it, because in H.P. Lovecraft's work, the world is always ending, but never quite seems to. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, why not just get on with that and see what happens? And it was a very pretentious idea. And <laughs> I'm very glad the supervillain uh, saga came out first there, because that gave me the experience I tried to actually get that out and have people like it too. Fantastic. And what's next going on? More in the Well, I different? people keep buying the super villainy saga, so I'm going to keep turning those out. It's like, grab the plot left line in the fourth book, and then people were, fans were like, no, we'll keep buying. And it's like, well, let's see the sales on the other ones. Okay, new series. <laughs> let's keep writing on the current one that's selling. No, no, that's not true at all. I'm not motivated by money. That's, no, just art. <laughs> Tell me, do you like Glenn have, have beta readers, your fans? Do they give you feedback? Is that, you know, helping the direction of where things are going or are they just, I mean, they're just laughing? I, at I originally, uh, you know, we're seeking out, oh, early, I think the thing you got to understand, and I'm going to give that advice you were asked, talking about earlier about how, what are the things you would try and relay as a independent author or well-established author to people who want to become writers. The first one you should do is find someone who is already an author to help you guide you through the baby steps because you will embarrass yourself otherwise, mm -hmm. very much so. And you should definitely not uh, introduce yourself to a author you respect by going like, hey, this is my 300 page manuscript. Would you please read it and correct it? I'm not saying I did that, but I came pretty close and they uh, just gave me a card. Going, and that was the very nice of them saying like, this is a person who does independent publishing and they have a forum where a bunch of other authors correct each other. They will tell you your book sucks. Listen to them. <laughs> and I, I thankfully met some, some really fantastic people who did uh, tear my original book apart and manuscripts and tell me all the, all the wonderful mistakes that we're making. Like, uh, oh, here's where you take a three page digression talking about the magic system. <laughs> Not a good idea. Oh, here's a four-page digression where you're uh, 
ca uh, your character falls instantly in love with the other person and uh, oh, they are just absolutely perfect. No tension. Red penned at this point, but and uh, funnily enough there, uh, if you pay attention to all those corrections and rewrite your book about three times, it'll probably be worth uh, publishing. All right. Yes, and after that, you have the next thing you should learn from uh, other, ha getting to know other authors is find out from other authors whether the people that you are uh, submitting to or have contacted you with offers are in fact actually a scam. Um, there's been some unfortunate stories about all too many people who are t who are either vanity presses or just outright going to take your money and also ditto editors. And so there are a lot of people uh, looking to uh, take advantage of your dreams and you need to go uh, find someone to navigate through that there. There's a couple of forms that I would recommend too about uh, helping you through that. Uh, if you're really lucky though, you will uh, find someone to uh, be apprenticed to, so to speak, in the sorcerer's uh, Mickey Mouse sort of sense. Now there's a great visual, Mickey Mouse Sorcerer's Apprentice. Oh yes, because your, your first book will be a thousand broomsticks. <laughs> But you're absolutely right. Your first book is not your 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 final draft of your first book. It's oh, yes. good work. Oh yes, and you know there are also going to be uh, a good George Lucas quote here uh, saying that uh, a movie is never uh, complete; it's just abandoned. Well, that's not true with movies, but it is true with books. And you're going to often, until the time it is published and out there, be always constantly revising in your mind. You should follow that advice there because. Many times you will uh, make your work better and never become too attached to it. Mm. Yeah, that's it's true pretty much of every field. I mean, for computer games, there's always another bug to fix. There's always a feature you didn't get into the into it. Um, same with books. You know, you always feel like it could be made just a little bit better. But the thing I also learned about in computer games is there's a time to ship, and especially when you have a team of people, a large team of people who all need to make money. You know, they need to ship that product because they need to move on to the next one. And that's true okay. even as an author. You need to move on to the next game or the next, and if the next actually, book. If, yes, and if you actually manage to get a, a decent, and I'm not going to say good at writing, a thing you should also note is uh, don't throw away your past ideas or manuscripts uh, there. Put them in a trunk like Stephen King did. And uh, eventually when you are actually famous and good as an author, uh, you can, or whatever passes for it reach into that trunk go over it and be like oh my god this is terrible and then start correcting it and you will in fact probably have a decent book at the end of it uh, that, much easier and that's that's some veteran advice there and i'm not saying i've done it like five times <laughs> but it's why i got like 30 books out now rather than uh the five that are uh, i actually are fully confident we're but but you're absolutely right there is a time to say it's time it's time to be done. Um, you can you can uh, love something and correct something to death, and mm -hmm. and literally suck the soul right out of it in your correction. Oh yes, and, and you that, will also yeah. need to develop a very thick skin as both an author, either uh, for traditional publishing or uh, independent. And with uh, either, there are people who are going to hate something fundamental about your books, no matter what side on anything you take, even if you are the most generic uh, fluff imaginable there. I, I framed a few of my uh, hate reviews uh, that comment on, oh my God, there are gay and brown people existing here. And I'm not exaggerating. Oh gosh. <laughs> well, you may- like, there's way, too, there's way too many women doing stuff in this. I mean, like you think I'm making a parody and I'm not sadly. And it, it's just, you uh, need to write your, the book that pleases you first, and that should be your uh, primary guiding point. Mm -hmm. you, the first two lessons are, one, pay attention to what everyone criticizes about your book. Two, learn what not to. You're absolutely Like right. martial arts, you gotta get the, the whole contradictions for it to be sound wise. And, and you mentioned Stephen King, who famously, you know, the first time he got a rejection, he had a nail up above his desk, he had it all ready. He, he, feared the rejection up there. Eventually, there were so many rejections that he needed a big spike instead of a nail. So, you know, it's part of the game, shall we say. Oh, yes. And you remember, he threw away, uh, this may be an urban legend uh, that he's telling, but it really reflects uh, the emotions that are authentic to authors and that he threw away Carrie because he was like, no, I finished this. It's crud. I don't uh, care. And then his wife fished it out of the trash can and that's, uh, history was made. Absolutely, absolutely. So, oh yes, I uh, also recommend uh, for reading if you actually want a book that will 
tell you uh, how to get through at least some of the early things, I do recommend Stephen King's on writing mm -hmm. because even though I'm a comedy author rather than a horror author, uh, I certainly got a lot out of it there. And uh, he was very honest about uh, not being pretentious about it because uh, one of the tricks he said, how do you get in the mood to write a certain genre? And he says like, well, you know, some authors would tell you you should clear your mind of all influences and create something original. And I was like, no, not at all. Don't do that. What, you want to write a Western, write, watch like 400 Westerns. <laughs> which, which brings me to ask the two of you, when you are not writing, do you read? Do you like to read? Or are you too busy with comic books and video games? What's, uh... I'm, I mean, they're all uh, mediums of telling there. And I think video games are uh, just visual uh, interactive books. And I, uh, I think they're underestimated as a storytelling medium. I mean, there is some things like Pac-Man and there's also things that have as much dialogue as a, a, a few a few books of game of thrones <laughs> exactly including, including yeah. uh, and there's some that was written by the uh, george r. r martin as i recall yeah Thank yeah you. actually uh death gate has as much text as a traditional novel in it wow oh yeah so i mean we're we're a little past you know uh jumping on uh the turtles and uh rescuing the princess there <laughs> and uh you know, that's part of the uh, fun. And I uh, was definitely influenced by video games in some of my respects. And, and my forwards to my books, I mentioned when I was writing Cthulhu Armageddon, I was playing a lot of Fallout. And I'm like, you, if you notice some similarities, it's probably like that. I used to play Call of Cthulhu. I don't deny these influences. I embrace them. Please don't sue me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say that... Um a large part of my inspiration came from literature. I mean, that's why I wanted to make games based on, on literature. So I read a lot of the classic fantasy authors, but I also will say that we're living in a golden age of television and movies where they're taking things like fantasy and science fiction and, and adaptations of even comic books and graphic novels that are fantastic. I don't think I've seen this kind of quality for you know, ever, and it's uh, it's amazing. So I try to catch as many of those as I can as well. Absolutely. Well, since we're we're all into the visual aspect, tell me in your books if it was made into a movie, who's the star? Yeah, do you do you picture who's playing playing the role there? Glenn smiled. I'm curious. No, honestly, the the reason I smile is because I absolutely don't do that. <laughs> I. I I mean, I see the I see the um, the book as a movie in my head as I'm writing it, but I don't cast it. Okay. Um, and and it's really tough for me to sit down and figure out because I've gotten this question before in other interviews, and I just really say no, no. Let's let's figure that out when I've signed the contract. You didn't cast it, okay? <laughs> CT, do you cast your books in your head or no? Well, it's interesting. I cast my books with multiple actors, sort of speaking. Like whenever, as a way of uh, kind of drumming up a little interest, is like. Uh, I would never say that someone couldn't play a, a, a character if they're really good at the role or wanted to. I mean, like if they were doing the Netflix version of the Rules of Super Villainy and they said like, oh, we have this list of various cast members. I'm like, well, whatever gets me paid, friend. And that's like, oh, I'm not supposed to say that out loud. <laughs> no, but I, when I was early on there, I did uh, do a little uh, blog entry which listed uh, various actors that you could cast as uh, the characters to help with the visual effects because some fans get a tickle out of that. Right. And it was like going, I, Captain Cold from uh, The Flash, Wentworth Miller and Prison Break, you know, he could do a good Gary. And I said, Deborah Ann Wall could be Cindy, the redheaded Harley Quinn-esque figure. And all these characters uh, would be good, uh, but you know, it's really who the reader wants to be in the, uh, their case. And that is uh, something you can't take away from them either. Right. Right. And that itself is why we always say the book is better than the movie, because the reader then gets to decide. That's Unless it's ready for your one. I'm sorry, Ernest. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me something, CT. What do you do to get the creative juices flowing? I mean, I, you are bubbling over with it, so maybe you don't have to do much. Oh, I, I've had my uh, period of a uh, writer's block there. I will be honest, the, the pandemic uh, killed my writing for a year while everyone, well, some of the other people were like saying like, oh, it had me having the quiet and all that. It's like, no, I had quiet before. That was when everyone in the house was at their jobs. Mm. <laughs> yes. No, I was uh, doing all sorts of things and surrounded by noise and distracted and also just worried about the world as in general. And uh, that just definitely put me off writing. But if you want to be inspired, I do believe 
I have a couple of tips, and again, mostly stolen from Stephen King. The first is do surround yourself in your genre, put yourself in that world, and uh, and the kind of things that you want your book to be like. You don't have to worry about stealing because you know you uh, you are being inspired for your own story by the things you love. So yeah, definitely read as much as possible in the genre you're trying to write, and uh, enjoy the what other people have done with it. Mm -hmm. Take, uh, you know, you're not going to be uh, writing an exact replica of whatever. Uh, you're going to be putting your own spin on it just by being a different person. Okay. And another uh, thing to definitely write is don't try and trace tr chase trends. Mm. Write with a book you want to read yourself, and that will be the uh, best advice I can give to you there. It's e because people I've met who are like, like oh, I want to succeed in urban fantasy, and I'm like, you and 10,000 other people. And uh, if you love urban fantasy, true there, but you have to let your audience find you. You can't like try and trait and write something that will be the next a big thing without actually being ahead of the next big thing. Right. No, ch chasing audience. That's a really good thing to stay away from because it's a, a lose lose there. Yeah, I, I I agree with that approach. I, I'm also I don't really understand um, the author who can write a book a month. Um, I, I could never even approach that and that because it would take me a month even to, to start thinking about what I wanted that book to be and what I wanted it to say. Um, and I, 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 there's no way I could chase genres either. I think I could write science fiction or I could write fantasy. I've done both, but I don't, I can't, you know, pick, you know, uh, the, the genre of the day and figure out, okay, that's where the money is right now. And so that's the audience that I'll chase and because it's not really about that. I mean, anyone who goes into, especially indie publishing, you're not chasing a lot of money. You know, maybe eventually you might get a break and you might see, you know, some, uh, some sales that, that sort of pay for itself and, and a bit more. But if you're in it to make money, then there are better ways to do that. And I, I think you need to be here because you want to tell a story. You need oh, yeah. to tell that story. And that's, that's why I write the books that I do. Oh, yeah. Can I tell you the old joke? Go ahead. Oh, yes. What's the difference between a pizza and a writer? A pizza and a writer? Yes. A pizza can feed a family of three. <laughs> it's unfortunate. You, you don't do this for the uh, money there. I mean, you can succeed in the money there, but that is when technically, if you want to be rich as a writer, then you have to uh, be either start as it or <laughs> have someone make a movie out of your book. Uh, you can make a good, decent living, especially if you... Uh, know the right tricks there and build an audience uh, for yourselves, either social media or just having your readers go from previous books you've written like 30 or 40 and uh, come to buy your next one and all together. Uh, but it's a slow demanding process and one uh, that there's no guarantee of success there. But it's, if you don't quit your day job like acting, mm -hmm. uh, it can certainly become a, a big start as a good supplementary income and uh, yes, you can make a living at it. Just don't uh, keep your expectations realistic. Yes. And that can be very depressing. It, it could be. It could be. But uh, so we were talking about setting the scene for getting those creative juices flowing. Um, where is that? Glenn, if you could, uh, money is no object. Where do you want to go for your next uh, writing jaunt or research? Oh, I don't know. I could go anywhere. I, I mean, I, one of the places I went is actually when I was courting my wife, I went to Italy for the first time and explored some of the medieval castles there. And it was amazing. I actually, at the time I was working on Wheel of Time, so I was taking a lot of uh, shots just for uh, textures, to make uh, textures that go onto the 3D surfaces in Wheel of Time. Um, but just being able to walk inside those spaces was really inspiring. Um, but I'd say for me, I don't actually experience writer's block. Um, I always approach my writing like I do design, which is it's a, a sort of a logical problem that I need to solve. And I do that by walking down every possible path or having my characters walk every possible path that they could. And when they get to the end and they get to a satisfying conclusion, one that just clicks that you know it's right, that's when I'm able to move forward. But I'm never stopped. I'm always walking down those paths. And that's kind of what a designer does. He, he will walk down that path. He'll play the game in his head before anybody codes anything. And then once he figures it out, then you start coding. 
And uh, there were some companies that figured, oh, well, let's just start coding and figure out what happens. And, no, no, no. You <laughs> save a lot of money if you've thought about what it's supposed to be before you start coding. And actually, as a, a writer, I'm kind of, people ask me, am I a plotter or a pantser? And the truth is, I feel like I'm a plotter, but I'm actually sort of a hybrid because I do sit down and I do make an outline. I have a map and I give my map to my characters and I say, follow this. And sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. And so that's when I have to figure out, okay, where exactly are you going and how do I deal with this? But I learned even in game design that discovery is a huge part of the process and you ignore it at your peril because you might discover something that was so much better or more interesting than where you had planned to go. And so, yes, I can't start without a map, but a map doesn't always go where I think it's going to go. Right. CT, how about you? Plotter, panther, something in between? Well, I definitely think that I s handle my writing a bit like I used to handle my old tabletop RPGs, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, Call of Cthulhu, and uh, Mutants and Masterminds. Well, basically, I am the storyteller. I set the world up uh, around and the rough idea of what's going on, but then I let the characters dictate where uh, they're going to go when presented with the information and scenario they are. And uh, it's my escape uh, from the rest of the world, so I don't need to vacation anywhere to get inspired for this thing because I'm going into my world to uh, play around in. And so I definitely have written some books where I have this very specific idea of where, where it's supposed to go, and then the characters take me in a wildly different direction. I think the uh, biggest example would be the ending to Lucifer Star, which I'm not going to spoil, but uh, just to give you an idea about what happened there, uh, there was this big epic galaxy uh, changing event that was going to happen, Lucifer Star being a kind of a dark Star Wars uh, kind of universe. Uh, and then the, the characters in their typical Han Solo-esque way went, yeah, this is bad, uh, I'm out of here. <laughs> and it was more interesting for the fact is like, I don't care who wins, I don't have a skin in this game and I won out and mm -hmm. I'm going to get, and getting out became the, uh, the joke of it while everyone is shooting everyone else. It's like, yeah, goodbye. It made a very interesting sequel, actually, because no, we did not actually want to save the galaxy at all. We were interested in saving ourselves, and good luck with that. <laughs> well, that's always fun when characters do not stick to the script, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yes. And Gary, Gary's a good character uh, in my uh, super villainy saga. The funny thing is, when you were reading the back cover, you forgot to add the trademark to uh, his... Uh, title there. It's not just Merciless, the supervillain without mercy. It's Merciless, the supervillain without mercy, trademark. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, yes. That. You're right. Yes. Well, Gary has a very uh, unrealistic idea about what a supervillain is because he grew up in this world where superheroes and supervillains are real and he is not quite as aware about what they are about as he thinks he is. Uh, he thinks of uh, supervillains as kind of anti-establishment, uh, heroic, fight the man kind of powers when for the majority they're just a bunch of really awful people. <laughs> and since he is living that bizarre Robin Hood uh, meets uh, punk 80s uh, kind of dream, no superhero actually understands how he's doing the things he's done and why. It's like, yeah, that's where I gave away the money and his partners go like, why did you do this? Are you inspired at all by Dr. Horrible? You know, I did, in fact, uh, I was halfway through the book when I uh, watched it for the first time there, and that definitely uh, was the vibe I was doing, even though, mm -hmm. and re had reached the same thing there. Uh, it's uh, very sad that we never got the sequel to that, because uh, that would have been uh, just watching them do the musical parody of all the typical superhero tropes again. And I also wanted them to bring back Penny. No support. <laughs> for 20-year-old uh, musical on the web. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, 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 Felicia Day could def would definitely be someone I would pick for my, uh, for my adaptation there, and she already does Netflix, so. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. If you were going to write your next book and it wasn't going to be in this genre, not a series book, something completely off the map, have any inklings for what that would be? Oh, I'm cur currently I'm uh, writing another uh, cyberpunk uh, book there. Oh, okay. uh, I, I do definitely love uh, both uh, 
these niche genres there like it's not just fantasy it's superhero fantasy yes. it's not just uh, science fiction it's cyberpunk you know that genre from the 80s that died and we have uh, keep uh, keeps coming back because it is awesome <laughs> Just, just ignore the bugs in the current game. <laughs> All right, so two going at once. How about you, Glenn? Uh, I have to say that, I, I mean, I have one book under my belt with, an, well, another one coming out soon, and I'm working into a, a third. I'm not done with this genre anytime soon. Yeah. I, I like it. It, it. I know it. It knows me. Um, I'm, I'm sticking with it. I think if, uh, if I had to choose another genre, I'm not sure that I could pull it out of the air. I mean, science fiction is the only one that I would go after because right. I have some experience, but now, I'm, I actually, I'm not only um, fantasy, I'm YA fantasy. Right, right. And it's because I really like speaking to that audience. Awesome. Um, yeah, I, I think that's that's where I am. It's so good to know where you are, what you want, and who your people are. So many people, they don't know that at all. Well, let's make sure that some of your people are out here and remind them of your books and where they can find you. Um, Glenn Dahlgren's The Child of Chaos. And please visit him at mysterium.blog. Glenn, you're the first person I've seen with a dot blog as ah, well, a web address. Um, I think if you pay a little bit of money to WordPress, you get a dot blog. If you pay them a lot of money, then you get a dot com. Oh, okay. So <laughs> that's why I have dot blog. Well, I think and I will, I will say that um, Child of Chaos um, is not only available in ebook and paperback and hardback, um, but also audiobook. And oh. that is something that I, um, I self narrate. And cool. so far, it's been getting uh, rave reviews. So I think I did a pretty good job. And it kind of makes sense. I did actually a bunch of um, a bunch of auditions with existing narrators. And I, I got a bunch of them and I said, I could do that. In fact, I've done voice uh, direction for my games. I've done even some, some characters in some of my games. Why do I not do it myself? And I would kick myself if I didn't. So I went ahead and did it. And awesome. uh, People seem to like it. So check that out too, the audiobook. And I'm actually recording the audiobook for Game of War right now. Fantastic. Well, maybe not right now. Right now you're with me. <laughs> I just stopped editing to do this interview. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and CT Phipps, uh, the whole series, the Tournament of Super Villainy um, and all the other Super Villainy. And please visit him at ctphipps.wordpress.com. Dot com. I'm sure for both of our authors today, if you visit them, you'll find out about all their books, sign up for newsletters, specials, find out what's going on in their world next so that you can keep up with them, catch up with them, and maybe even get a freebie along the way. And uh, they're going to get right back at that. Um, CT, any audiobooks for you or is that? Uh... Oh, yes. Audiobooks is the reason that I was able to become a, a professional writer uh, as a distinction, which I think is a not really as fair as it used to be about 10 even 15 years ago really? uh but yes uh, audiobooks are uh, where definitely where i was at there and uh the rules of super villainy has 5,000 ratings wow on Audible, which actually which actually beats out some authors i really love and respect there uh but uh my next book what has like 50 <laughs> Five thousand. If you can if you can afford to get a professionally narrated book, or just happen to have some great talent like Glenn here, uh, getting an audio book is definitely a no a brainer. Uh, and it's not something that some everyone can afford there, but it's an entirely new audience, and there's less competition, at least for the first few years uh, of this, than every single other uh, electronic and uh, paperback book out there. Um, I, I will say it, it feels daunting um, thinking about doing your own audiobook because you have no idea what the, uh, the hardware or software requirements or what kind of place you need. And I actually walked through that in one of the, in a, um, a blog article. I walked through my experience making that, um, uh, that audiobook. So I, I invite everyone to come and just see how I did it. Oh, yes. Awesome. Definitely helpful there. And I uh, was lucky enough to have of my friends at Crossroad Press, which was founded as a kind of uh, press for established authors who were sick of the traditional system there. Uh, its founder, David Neal Wilson, is a Stoker Award winner and former head of the HWA Horror Writers Association. So, you know, he was definitely trying to create something for authors, by authors. And well, he was very nice to introduce me to uh, my favorite narrator, Jeffrey Caper, who I give props to uh, making my super villainy saga and the Agent G books. And he came with his own fandom, so I lucked out there. Nice. 
Nice. Well, great tips for our viewers out there on how to get started, how to get inspired. And for our viewers, make sure you find out how to get these guys books. Glenn CT, thank you so much for joining me. You were awesome and happy writing. Thanks very much. Thanks for joining us on Between the Covers. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're an author who would be interested in appearing on our show, or perhaps you're a member of a book club, we do host book clubs as well, please visit BetweenTheCoversTV.com. By the way, at BetweenTheCoversTV.com, you can watch past episodes in addition to learning more about our authors and guests. So sign up there if you would like to be a guest on the show yourself. And if you have some books that you would like to get written or published, visit redpenguinbooks.com. Thanks so much for joining us.